Ultraverse must be the coolest introduction of a banker I've ever seen. And you may think I'm a banker because I'm wearing a suit, which is what bankers wear. But I'm not. I'm actually a technologist, which is why I don't have a tie. Um, and in fact, I can wear whatever I want. And I thought that you all came back for the music, so I'm glad that you're still here. Um, because I'm going to talk about what's happening in the world of financial services, which is interesting at the moment because it's integrating itself into the internet, open sourcing itself, reinventing itself, and being reimagined for the 21st century web, the next web, the semantic web. It's interesting, the semantic web was talked about a lot a decade ago, and it's not really talked about at all today even though it's something that Tim Berners-Lee coined as a phrase because in 1989, he became what's known as the father of the web. In 1999, he produced a paper about the semantic web. And he defined it as a web of data that can be processed by machines, where the day-to-day -day mechanisms of trade, bureaucracy, and our daily lives is handled by machines talking to machines. That's not how I think of it. <laughs> I think of it as when the internet has a consciousness. It becomes alive. It knows all about us. And instead of having an internet of things, which is what the semantic web is based upon, it's an internet of me. <laughs> so it'll know all about me. It'll look after my life. It'll advise me in real time. It'll handle all the mundane activities of life for me so that I just enjoy my life and I don't have to think about what's administration and bureaucracy. That's all gone away. And in fact, it's proactive, so it tells me things I need to know. I don't need to Google anymore. I just have answers. And to get there, we've got the technologies that are moving very quickly to develop that capability. In particular, deep data analytics, deep learning. The whole ability that Google and Ant and Alibaba and other companies are developing so we can build an internet of data that's automatically gathering our digital footprints and working out how to make our lives the best they can be. Equally, to achieve that involves a lot of machine learning. So we're talking artificial intelligence, machine learning, all the buzzwords of the last 12 months. It's all well and good. And the core of what the semantic web is delivering is the ability to know more about me, where I am, what I'm doing, and what I need than anything else. So my life becomes simple and easy. I don't have to book anything anymore. I just think I'm going to Amsterdam. It's done for me. I just think I want that hot dog. It's done for me. It's all automated, it's all digitalized, it's all in the semantic cognitive web. So the leading companies developing these technologies right now are Google, Amazon, Facebook, but equally you should look very carefully at, Facebook, at Tencent, at Badu, and particularly at Alibaba, who in my view are leading this charge more fundamentally than the American players, because in America, Google, Amazon, Facebook, PayPal are all separate systems for social, mobile, and commercial capabilities. Whereas Alibaba, Badu, Tencent are an ecosystem of social, mobile, financial, all in one app. It's much easier to give you a semantic life if your whole life socially, commercially, and financially is in one ecosystem. And that will be delivered by the Chinese giants, more likely than the, than the Americans. When we look at AI from the American side, though, you've got Google's experiments in 2012, five years ago, it's showing that this is actually a lifetime ago, to say this is what Google's AI engines thought a cat looked like based on YouTube videos. Facebook announced three years later that they know more about you and your family and your friends than you do because their facial recognition is better than your eyeballs. So they can auto tag everything for you if you wanted, but maybe it's a bit scary for some. And then I was really interested in the experiment at the end of last year, not the Go game that Google's AI engines won, but the experiment they did between three different programs where they told the first to talk to the second and make sure the third doesn't understand what they're talking about. It didn't take very long for that to be achieved by their AI engines, but equally the Google engineers didn't know what they were talking about either. 
But right now, the intelligence is being used to get rid of the mundane tasks. For example, JP Morgan just recently in February said that their wholesale contracts between their corporate clients and the bank are now analyzed and approved in a second by their AI engine, which previously would have taken 360,000 hours of legal work. So we make the lawyers redundant. This is good news. But go back to China. Ant Financial, which is the payment subsidiary that's been spun off last year, worth $60 billion, which is two Barclays banks. Not bad for a five-year-old company. Are aiming to get 2 billion users by 2025. 2 billion people in their ecosystem. Right now, they have 500 million in China. And they've just been doing an acquisition spree to go global. And this is where we see the future financial system. And that, for example, virtual reality is big in China. And so Alibaba and Ant Financial, at the end of last year, launched a virtual reality payment system called VRPay. It's quite interesting looking at how they launched it. They have a video where a guy is shopping for a present for his wife in a virtual shop. And he's looking around the virtual shop and thinking, I don't know, shall I buy her shoes or handbags or a new dress or maybe some underwear? I wonder what this underwear looks like. It looks pretty nice. Yeah, it looks pretty nice. Yeah, it looks pretty nice. <laughs> Everything in innovation and technology is driven by sex. And by being driven by sex, it creates whole new ways of doing commerce and trade that demands a new way of doing financial value exchange. It absolutely demands and mandates. I have to have a new payment system to deal with this new way of doing things. For example, you can even get an internet-based refrigerator that serves for porn. I have no idea why you would do that, but you can get it if you want it. Robotics is already moving towards the idea that we're going to sleep with our robots. We'll fall in love with our robots. They'll be our sole partners, because they don't talk back. You only have to look at some of the movies to see this idea. And Ray Kurzweil, Google's head of AI, predicts that we will have relationships with technologies that we don't realize are technologies within the next decade. But looking back, every innovation in technology has created a new form of financial system to support eroticism. The photographic industry created in the 1830s didn't thrive and succeed until postcards could be exchanged that were interesting. The Gutenberg printing press, you may think, was invented for producing Bibles. It was actually produced for the Gutenberg Guide to Intimacy, which sold 10 times more copies than the Bibles. In fact, there's about five revolutions in humanity that have been identified in the last 200,000 years, and is a theme of what I'm working on right now. And the main dramatic change in humanity came around 5,000, 10,000 years ago in ancient Sumeria, or Mesopotamia, if you prefer, which is Iraq today. This ancient city of Eridor, which I just showed, is where Basra is based today. And when looking at the ruins of Eridor, an ancient pot was found, which was in the Baghdad Museum and survived the Gulf War. And what this ancient vase shows is farmers coming up to the temples with produce of goods of wheat and barley to store in the temples in exchange for money. Hey, we invented money. Why did we invent money? We invented money so that the farmers could go into the temple and have intimacy with the goddess of fertility represented by all the ladies of ancient Eridor. So prostitution was actually a thing to be proud of in that ancient culture and was the first profession. The second was accountancy. And where that leads us to is that when we understand how money really works, it's a control mechanism that supports criminal, cr criminality and pornography and other illicit activities to begin with, so they thrive and grow and create the ecosystem of trade and exchange for the future, which leads us to the semantic bank, the bank that knows more about you than you do. 
which you may say is actually here already. You know, if we invented money 5,000 years ago, we invented banking 300 years ago, mainly to support the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution meant that we had to go across borders doing trade, and how could you trust money between borders? Because it's not really easy to see why that particular coinage is usable in this particular country. And that's the reason why banking was invented, so that paper could be transacted with trust because the government backs the paper, the check. So we could do counterparty trade, which today is still big news. And it's difficult because we have an old network. We have an old network called SWIFT in Belgium. And SWIFT is based on counterparty trade being done through paper-based exchange and now automated exchange. And the origins of the banking system of today is this idea of a check in the post. A great idea 300 years ago doesn't work today. I get a check today for more than $10,000. It takes 28 days and costs me $200 to get it processed because of the old counterparty network systems put in place for the old Industrial Revolution era. I don't want something that's slow and expensive. I want it to be fast and free for the internet age. And we can do that, and we're building that today. You know, I can transact billions on the Bitcoin network on a Sunday morning in minutes for a fee of less than $10. So why should I pay $200 for a small check to be processed? Because of the overhead of humans and buildings. In the digital age, if we have this semantic, semantic web where the machines are all intelligent, transacting with each other and trading with each other, then a lot changes. And we can see that change coming through right now in these numbers. You, the Ubers and Airbnbs of this world have far fewer people to produce the valuations that they produce because they're providing platforms that connect people that need things and people that have things without any humans involved. In the industrial era, to run a hotel chain or to run a taxi service required lots of administration and buildings and people. That's the overhead. And the semantic bank is starting to come through. It's already been developing in the back rooms of fintech companies and some banks. The bank that knows more about you than you do. It's deep diving into all of the digital footprint that they can get about each and every individual and using algorithms and software and servers, predictively and proactively and cognitively and intelligently working out what you need to run your life financially. So you don't have to think about how you run your life. It does it for you because you've given it permission. He said, go and do that for me because I don't want to deal with money, thanks very much. Money's boring. Banks are boring. Should be. You know, banks are also seeing this flattening of their structures through apps, APIs, and analytics because software and servers have taken over from branches and humans. By 2025, at least a third of the banking community will lose their jobs, which you may say with the lawyers is a good thing. It's a different world. And if the semantic web is where Google is no longer searching, it's just giving you answers, you just think, and it says, that's the answer. You know, who was that just on stage? Ultraverse. Who did speak just before me? Moon Ribas. Try remembering that in 10 years. Google will remember it for you, <laughs> and it'll be in your head. You'll reach the singularity by 2029, a Ray Kurzweil prediction, where ne networks and systems know more about everything than humans do because it supports humans to live their lives far more easily. And a semantic bank becomes something that's not a bank. It's just looking after your life and making it easy to consume, travel, trade, wherever you want to, whenever you want to, easily, without thinking about it. We move from these people who advise to these systems that advise. And often when you see these things, they make it look scary. It's not scary. It's exciting. Changing our lives so we can talk with chatbots and get answers without having to go in and call someone or deal with someone, particularly when money is frightening and we don't like dealing with these suits. We want to deal with people remotely who feel like humans, but they're actually chatbots, like Bank of America's Erica, which is called Erica because it's a shortened version of America. Very soon, this will transition towards the chatbots that are avatars, that look like humans, but they're actually automated intelligent machines that have human faces. These are already starting to develop out there. They're not there yet. Five years, maybe less. It's the smart era for the smart bank. 
supporting smart humans living lives easily without thinking about anything. So as you walk around and you think, oh, can I afford that car? Yes, you can. But if you buy that, you know, you may be forfeiting three months of your pension. It's your choice. I would advise you that you can have it. Equally, if you see this street and you like this house, you can have it. But not if you want to go on a holiday, <laughs> you know. Stay, stay at home if you, want, if, you, know, you need to save a bit more. If you go on a holiday, you can't afford that house, sorry. But you can maybe get the house if you spend a little time in the casino. And you can afford to bet 20,000 today. You're not thinking these things, you're not doing these things, you're just going in places and it's telling you this is what you can do. Safely, easily, smartly. You know, this really is going to cost you a lot if you go down that route. I would not advise this one. Um, I, sh I should know. Oh, anyway, that's another story. <laughs> the bank becomes invisible. Isn't that a nice idea? <laughs> invisible banking. You know, invisible banking is actually already starting. It's moving to a world where you never think about paying for anything. You just live your life, like getting in an Uber. What a relief not having to rattle change in your pockets. That's the sort of life we all want, isn't it? Not having to pay for anything. You never saw Captain Kirk pay for anything. Why should you see some people paying for stuff? It's ridiculous in this world of the next web. Everything should be easy, smooth, frictionless, living our lives semantically, being supported by an intelligent system. So what you end up with is your television and your entertainment center knows what you want. You don't have to tell it. It also finds things that it thinks you might want that go along with things that you want. So you don't have to work out whether to watch uh, Brain Dead on, that, on Amazon Prime. It will know that you will like that sort of thing based on your tastes. We're already there. But the payment for that will be something that's irrelevant because it's only happening intelligently. Your fridge will replenish without you having to think about it, except when there's something exceptional, like, for example, my wife is Polish, and so maybe when it orders 12 bottles of vodka because my mother-in-law is coming, it'll tell me you might want to think about that transaction. When we're self-driving, the car self-fuels, self-energizes. We don't have to think about this anymore. It's silly in the next web age to have a system financially that forces people to go into buildings or that forces people to deal with humans. We'll just deal with a ubiquitous network that allows us to live our lives fantastically with fun. I can't wait. Thank you. <laughs>